Hello and welcome to today's meeting of Democrats of Greater Tucson. My name is Larry Bodine and I'm the president of Democrats of Greater Tucson. Our guest today is uh, my legislator, my representative in the State House, Pamela Powers Hanley. Pamela, how are you? Great, Larry. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. And just to show you, you know, the depth of my support, um, I have on my Pamela Powers Powers for the People t-shirt. <laughs> So you know where my heart lies. I wanna urge everybody on this call to volunteer for a candidate or volunteer with your uh, local legislative district. It's really important now that, you know, the, the polls are saying good things, but the polls have been wrong. You know, there's all sorts of positive indicators, but that's only gonna play out. If everybody on this call gets active, does something, and uh, you know, makes a difference. So some of the things you can do uh, that we're doing in Legislative District 9 is we're visiting Facebook, going to the LD9 and other Democratic Facebook pages, sharing them, commenting on them in a positive way. The same thing with Twitter, you know, Joe Biden is on Twitter. You just go to, you know, at Joe Biden and retweet what he has to say. This is all very effective. This is gonna be an online campaign. So you need to get online. Also, write letters to the editor. You know, Harvey Akerson has led the charge on that for years and, you know, totally support him. We need to get uh, our viewpoints expressed on the editorial page. Get a yard sign. I have a couple of yard signs in my own front yard. And I know some people are reluctant sometimes about putting up yard signs because they think neighbors will complain. Well, actually, you will find that the opposite happens. I put up a yard sign and all my neighbors called me up and said, where can I get one? And I've been distributing Biden placards like the one here in the background all over my neighborhood. And then also get active with the organized campaign, which is now the Mission for Arizona. You can get involved in uh, mass texting events. Uh, surely you know how to use a text. Uh, that's the only way to stay in touch with kids anymore. And you can call Democrats because the most important thing is that you know, with everything going crazy with the post office, you've got to make sure when you get that ballot, vote it immediately and put it in the mail or take it to a drop-off box. So now's the time for action. So let me introduce Pamela Powers Hanley. She was elected to the state legislature in 2016 and she's running for a third term. Today, she's gonna to talk about economic and public health challenges facing the legislature next year envisioning a more just post-COVID-19 world. She's gonna talk about why we need a blue wave in Arizona and the US in just a few weeks. Um, so, you know, in order to have any chance of building a more just world. And I don't wanna crowd any more of your time, Pamela. You're my representative. Take it away and tell us what we should do. Well, thanks so much, Larry, for inviting me. And when I was uh, putting together my thoughts for today, I realized that it was actually Five years ago this month is when I declared that I was going to run for Legislative District 9. So I started my, my first campaign. I announced my uh, intention to run at the Unitarian Church, and I ran an unabashedly progressive campaign based on uh, many, you know, what people thought were sort of maybe wild-eyed progressive ideas back in 2015, but we've made progress on those ideas. I based my campaign on raising revenue and eliminating corporate tax giveaways and creating a public bank to spur economic, our economy and to build local small businesses. I promoted raising the minimum wage, which was on the ballot back in 2016, tackling income inequality, ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, and fighting discrimination against women and other minority groups. Lastly, I was the only person back in 2015 who was even talking about the war on drugs and the opioid epidemic. I had suggested defunding criminalization of marijuana and putting that money towards fighting the opioid epidemic. And I was talking about that and mass incarceration before anybody was. I also promoted the idea of being the voice of the people in the legislature instead of the voice of the corporations. And since I am a clean elections candidate and I continue to run clean, I am not dependent on big money donations, and that has allowed me to speak my mind. And if you follow me on Facebook, you know that I'm pretty good about speaking my mind and speaking truth to power in the Arizona legislature. So now 
More than ever, with COVID-19 virus creating financial and public health insecurity in our country and in our state, Arizona needs experienced leaders who, can, who will fight for the people and not kowtow to the corporations. The coronavirus has revealed many, many deep-seated disparities and inequalities in widespread race, sex, and gender dis discrimination in our country. These were broken systems that are cemented into our laws that we ignored because they were part of the status quo, or maybe we thought we had no chance of changing them. For example, underfunded public schools, mass incarceration, voter suppression, food and housing insecurity, environmental degradation in the name of profit, healthcare deserts, medical bankruptcy, violence against innocents. This is domestic violence, gun violence, domestic terrorism, and police violence. All of these are broken systems that we have tolerated and that have been baked into our laws. So we should talk not only about structural racism, but structural disparity that has been caused by our politicians and our political leaders. So it's time for reform. The COVID virus is giving us a reset in a lot of ways. There were so many bad bills that died in the legislature. We would be in way worse shape if those 18 tax giveaways worth a billion dollars had passed, if those 20 voter suppression bills had passed. And so it's time for a reform. It's historic time in the state of Arizona. The Democrats have not been in this position since the mid 1960s, okay? We could take the Arizona legislature. The Democrats could take the Congress and we have to take the presidency and more on that later. But it's time to end austerity for the people and welfare for the corporations and that's what we've got. Giving away billions of dollars in taxpayer funds annually was already an unsustainable path for the state of Arizona, but continuing this carte blanche corporate and special interest tax giveaways during the COVID-19 era and beyond is fiscally irresponsible. We need those funds to rebuild our state and our economy. Tax breaks have to stop. We have, we can't afford them. We just can't, we couldn't afford them before, we really can't afford them now. Arizona should be investing in future generations. We should fund the people's to-do list. How many times have you heard me say this already? We should be funding education, infrastructure, healthcare, and security, not the corporate wish list of tax giveaways, deregulation, privatization, and sweetheart deals. In the legislature, I have served on key committees, health and human services for four years, ways and means, regulatory affairs, and banking insurance for two years each. I have the knowledge and experience to negotiate the tough medical and financial decisions that we face in, in 2021. Uh, we have made progress on some of the issues from 2015. Uh, the opioid Arizona, Arizona Opioid Epidemic Act was passed in early 2018. I played a major role in crafting and passing it. I helped the Democratic Caucus craft our comprehensive COVID-19 response package. It's too bad. The Republicans didn't want to have a plan going into this back in March. You know, we've seen how well that worked to just wing it on the virus. Uh, I also worked to expand mental, physical, and dental health care. I fought for research-based medicine in the health committee instead of internet-based conspiracy theories on medicine. Um, dozens of corporate tax giveaways went down during 2017 to 2020. And in fact, progressives and libertarians, you know, groups that you don't necessarily think of working together, consistently voted against tax giveaways long before it read for Ed started in the spring of 28. To date, I am the only Democrat who has voted against every corporate tax giveaway in the last four years. This is a bipartisan issue. There are D's and R's on both sides of this coin. Just look at the Arizona Chamber of Commerce endorsement list and look at the campaign finance reports and you'll find who's on what side of that question and who's being backed by the big money. In addition, I propose major legislation to improve and expand maternal and child health care, improve birth outcomes and save money at the same time. Again, this was not ever heard by the Republican majority. I analyzed the data from the Arizona Department of Health Services and found a 12% drop in prenatal care across the board in the state of Arizona in 2013. 
for, for African-American women in Arizona, it went down 30%, a 30% drop in prenatal care. Nobody in the government has any explanation of why that happened, and nobody made any attempt to fix that except for the Democrats. So it doesn't do us any good to allow children to start their lives out in poverty and in sickness because their mothers didn't get prenatal care. So we have the worst record for adverse childhood experiences in the entire country. Far too many moms and children are living in poverty and forced to live with food and housing insecurity. And the Arizona legislature has done nothing, 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 nothing on this issue. It's time for change. The COVID virus has pushed so many people to the brink of financial insecurity. We were, they were already there. Many of us were already there. So it's time for change. It's time to have a new legislature, right? Uh, the Republican majority prefers to ignore the needs of the people so they can pretend that they have a surplus that can be given away in tax cuts. So I don't want to belabor this list, but I also fought for uh, restoration of the Housing Trust Fund public education restoration, the universities, childcare tra tax credits, there were billions of dollars cut after the Wall Street crash in the early uh, you know, 2010, 2009, 2008. None of that has been restored. And that's what puts us in a really dire situation in the state of Arizona if the Republicans maintain control of the legislature because that those that funding that funding never will go back. They didn't give it back when they had the money. They just gave it away in tax breaks, and we are poised to do the same thing again. So we need to protect these uh, programs that help the people, and we need to restore the funding and add a few other things. Like for example, I proposed implementation of fair tenant landlord laws and property tax assistance for the help, help elderly to stall evictions and to keep people in their homes and to fight gentrification. What's ironic is that you see what's going on in the state of Arizona and uh, you see multiple groups talking about the same things, groups that never agreed with each other. For example, I was uh, the only Democrat who went to the Arizona Tax Research Association meeting in 2019. Those are the libertarian tax hawks. Uh, me and uh, Paulino, my, uh, the staff guy from uh, Ways and Means went there. And I almost, I swear, man, I was ready to pound on the table when the uh, director of ATRA got up there and said that they're tired of the cities and, and counties picking winners and losers with tax giveaways. You know, fast forward to the Financial Review Committee a meeting that I was in in December of 2019, where we were supposed to review the tax breaks and eliminate some of them. A businessman from rural Arizona, obviously Republican, stood up and said that the state and the government needs to stop picking winners and losers. In March of 2020, I spoke down in the barrio to citizens who and Latino activists who were concerned about gentrification they are talking about stopping the government from picking winners and losers. So you have Latino activists, you have rural businessmen, you have libertarian lobbyists all saying that the tax gravy train has got to end. We have to spend our money on the needs of the people instead of giving the money away. So, you know, what will the future bring? Uh, I think that uh, it's obvious that the world is not going to return to where it was in the post COVID-19 era. And that's why we really need to watch what's going on in government, right? We've already seen with the Trump administration, uh, with the CARES Act and some of the relief that they're more willing to help the big corporations. Let's give money to Shake Shack and to uh, the oil and gas industry to prop them up. But let's ignore the people. Let's ignore the local and state governments. Let's ignore the, you know, the, the poor people. Let's put people out onto the streets and prop up the corporations. We can't do this anymore, okay? It, there are estimates that 50% of the jobs that uh, were in the United States before COVID-19 won't exist in the future. We can't throw that many people out onto the street, right? We have to reinvent ourselves. And we need a legislature that's going to think like that when they come back to Phoenix. And so, 
you know, I, I think that we have to, as far as finance, we have to completely hold the line on tax giveaways because we really can't afford that. We need to invest in uh, our financial health of the state and the public health of the state. Uh, I also think that public banking is still one of the best and most sustainable ideas to foster local small businesses in the state of Arizona. Uh, I think we should look at that because it also would be a way to help uh, the local uh, economies for the, the municipalities. You know, they could, a public bank could help them um, build back better, as Joe Biden says. It could help them with those infrastructure pod projects because it would use a percentage of the, of the rainy day funds to do low interest loans, right? So it's not just giving the money away, it's actually making a tiny return on your investment to slowly build the economy rather than just uh, picking winners and losers. And so um, I think that uh, it is a good, public banking is a good way to, like I said, build uh, local small businesses, really small businesses, to build infrastructure, to help with the student debt crisis and to help us recover from COVID-19. Uh, in the public health area, I say again, you know, it doesn't do our country, our state, or our community any good to force people to live into poverty, poverty and sickness by having stingy policies. And that's what the state of Arizona has been doing for decades. I plan to reintroduce my uh, bills to improve and expand maternal and child health care, uh, to implement truth in renting, to restore the housing trust fund, and to prevent evictions and homelessness. Again, we are all in this together. We don't actually even know if there's going to be a post-COVID-19 world. It might be a chronic disease that we live with, that we do have to change our lifestyles and our work habits and our living habits forever. So we need to open our, open our minds and open our eyes to new ideas. Um, again, you know, we already know that uh, we knew before COVID-19 that there was going to be job losses because of technology. Uh, <clears throat> we really need to speed that up now. There will be some jobs that will be created because of the COVID-19, but there are other jobs that are going to be lost. And as far as I'm concerned, some of those jobs from the gig economy, yes, they helped poor people stay afloat, but that was not a good income. It was not sustainable for people to be rushing here and there and picking up packages and delivering packages and things like that and picking up people and delivering people. Uh, we really need to think in the future. Um, I think that one of the things that we should seriously think about is uh, universal basic income. Again, this is an economic issue that both progressives and libertarians have proposed in the past. What the pandemic unemployment showed us was that if people were secure in their housing and had food on their table and with just a modest amount of money that they could innovate, right? You see, you know, you see people who have, you know, little homegrown nurseries, you know, ha teaching people how to do container gardening on YouTube. Right. You see uh, dance bands that used to play in uh, in clubs in Berlin doing uh, swing dance concerts from their living room and taking PayPal tips, you know, from people like me who like swing music. And so we can reinvent ourselves. The world could be better after COVID or with COVID. But again, we have to open our eyes to change. Uh, as far as governance, I think that there's a lot that could be done with governments. We need to end voter suppression. We need to repeal the past laws that perpetuate it. We need to institute automatic voter registration at 18, same day registration. We need to protect the citizens initiative. We need to repeal the attacks on it. We need to protect clean elections and expand it. We have to get money out of politics. The only reason that the corporations are in control of our government in Congress and the legislature is because of big money donations. If politicians had to compete on ideas and experience, we would have a completely different government in this state and in the Congress. So there's a lot that can be done. Uh, I don't wanna take up too much time. I've talked 20 minutes and I remember that was the old DGT limit. So I will respect that. I do want to say a bit about uh, the Republican challenger who is running against uh, Dr. Randy Fries and I. Um, he is being put up by the Chamber of Commerce. It's obvious that uh, the big money is playing in multiple races in the state of Arizona this year. Uh, we saw it 
in the primary with hundreds of thousands of dollars in dirty money and big money propping up certain Republican and Democratic candidates. So that's what's happening in my race. And uh, so I, I bring it on, you know, bring it on. I, I think it will be the sweetest victory for me as a clean elections progressive to beat a corporate Demo corporate Republican who is backed by the Chamber of Commerce. So he is for opening up the Arizona, Arizona economy too early. He's for privatized health care because you always loved your privatized health care, huh? You didn't want Medicare for all, nah, nah, nah. Uh, he's also for, uh, you know, propping up big insurance. He's backed by the developers. And so uh, he's also backed by the prison industrial complex. So I guess people have been, you know, uh, paying attention to what I've been saying about prison labor and uh, prison reform. So anyway, like I said, we have to win this in November, people. We have to win it for the people of the United States. Um, uh, Joe Biden wasn't my first candidate, but I loved the DNC um, convention in last week. It gave me hope for the future. And um, let's do this. We have to do this. So thanks for listening to me and I'll take any of your questions. All right, Pam, we've got a, a whole bunch of questions, but everybody wants to know how to get a Pamela Powers Hanley yard sign. There's two ah. ways. So everybody grab a pen real quick. <laughs> well, actually uh, I have AJ Flick uh, working with me this year uh, on my campaign and she's my campaign manager. And so she's the person to contact regarding the signs. Uh, I also, uh, my website is powersforthepeople.net. Uh, you can, uh, you know, leave a message there and we'll get back to you through there. I'm also on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, AJ's, you know, following me through all those. And so any of those uh, loopholes, any of those places you can get a sign. Uh, we're also looking for people to write postcards to people, uh, maybe do virtual house parties. And so there's lots of ways that you can help me out. Absolutely. And AJ's telephone number, write this down, is 520-338-0622. I want to see a lot of Pam Power Hanley uh, yard signs there. So the questions are pouring in. And uh, Pam, we have one from Barbara Warren. Barbara says, as we all know, we are experiencing extreme heat conditions and we've had rolling blackouts in some communities. Uh, how can you support establishing a s statewide statutes to protect outdoor workers and any people, uh, workers exposed to extreme heat on the job? Yeah, there's definitely a need to protect uh, workers outdoors uh, during this heat. And, uh, you know, I mean, I can barely stand to go outside and water my plants. I can't imagine people working outdoors in this heat. When I was part of the Family Sun Safety um, a program with the University of Arizona. We promoted shade and hats and things like that, but I think we've gone beyond that and we have to look at adjusting hours uh, and, um, and those sorts of things. But I'm willing to work with uh, Barbara Warren and Sierra Club and anybody else who's got, you know, really concrete ideas or model legislation that is passed in other states because obviously we need to protect workers from the heat. I mean, this, this summer has just been awful <laughs> with no rain. Our faithful member, Lee Oler. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Pam your question. Uh, Pam, I just, um, first of all, tell Jim that he can go put a sign in Biff's yard anytime he wants. <laughs> You'll know what I mean. As far as your whole race is concerned, I mean, the LD9 race, how is it coming along? What's the competition of these others? Where's the most emphasis have to be? Actually, um, uh, Victoria, Senator Steele does not have uh, a Republican opponent uh, for the Senate. Uh, the only challenger, Republican challenger in LD9 is Brendan Lyons, who is a, like you said, the chamber Republican. And his stated goal is to take me out. And so what's kind of interesting is that when we've had challengers in the past, male challengers, they always call up Dr. Freeze and say, you're okay. I want to get rid of her. And so that's what it has happened again this year is that, uh, and in fact, Brendan Lyons, since he's got significantly more money than our previous challengers, he actually put out a four page full color uh, PDF of his path to winning and sent it to lobbyists. A lobbyist, he's not meeting with you guys, right? He sent it to lobbyists saying, I want to meet with you and I want to meet with your corporate clients, right? 
And so <laughs> that's what I'm up against, and I am the target in LD9. Well, we'll take care of you. Don't worry. Steve Linder, uh, the DGT treasurer, has uh, his hand up. I'm so proud I, to live in uh, Legislative 9 and be represented by you and Randy and Victoria. My question is, have you heard anything concerning a special session that might be called either before or after the election? I mean, uh, I know that they might have one dealing with COVID and, and, and funding and this and that, but if the Democrats are successful in November, do you foresee any special session where the Republicans would come in after the election and cause havoc before January? Good question. Well, I, you know, I haven't heard much about a special session recently. I mean, the Democrats were meeting pretty consistently, uh, like in May and June, uh, coming up with our plans for a COVID-19 special session, because we assumed it would happen, but then nothing. And um, they, I, I don't think they're going to do anything. I mean, the Republicans want to have a special session because they think that Ducey is doing too much, Right. And so the, the Democrats are going to, not going to buy into a special session that actually has more deregulation and more opening up the economy and less science and public health. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, they could call it. It doesn't look like Ducey's going to call it because he doesn't, he doesn't want either side meddling with what he's up to, right? And so, um, you know, I don't know. Anything can happen with the Republicans. We saw that in, uh, in 2019 and 2020 where they – manipulated all the schedules and all the bills just to make sure their stuff passed and nothing else was heard. And so, um, you know, they could do anything. <laughs> Expect all, uh, you know, a plan for all contingencies, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, we've got a question from Lee Oler. First of all, I'd like you to repeat AJ's number again. All right. Well, the, uh, the number again for AJ is five. Let me, so grab a pen. I'm grabbing. Okay. 520 338 0622. 0622. Got it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah. And I don't think that there are any, are any signs at the headquarters these days. Uh, I'm, at least there aren't any of mine as far as I know. And uh, I don't know how much action is actually going on there since a lot of it is distributed. These phone calls and everything for candidates are. <clears throat> not necessarily being done at the headquarters. They're being done from the convenience of your own home. <laughs> Peggy, Peggy Wenrick. Uh, Peggy, I just clicked allow to talk. Hi, Pam. I want to do every single thing I can to elect you. You are a powerhouse. Um, because you're a clean elections candidate, are you able to accept donations for things like signs and stuff like that no no i'm not allowed to accept any more donations i've got my money um i've got about um just shy, shy of thirty thousand dollars sitting in the bank right now i've spent very little uh, i got my clean elections money like right after i was the top vote getter on the primary and so uh you know i'm going to spend it wisely mostly i spend my money on printing uh and postage uh but like I said, we are going to do some phone banking. We're going to do lit drops. Uh, I'll be collaborating with Dr. Freeze and Senator Steele and perhaps some of the uh, school board candidates on those lit drops. And so uh, you'll see stuff happening, you know, and if, if you don't want to walk around or you don't have the ability to walk around, there's, there's phone banking and postcards and talking to your neighbors, you know. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things that people can do. I need votes. I don't need the money. All right, we've got a question from Lucy Messing, another loyal Democrats of Greater Tucson member. Thank you, Larry. Hi, Pam. Hi. You know, I've been pretty involved in uh, learning about the tax giveaways and how we have to stop that. And so I agree with you 100 um, percent. If the Democrats take over and, and the state legislature, do you think we will move forward to at least review some of these tax giveaways? and maybe do away with those that are no longer necessary? Yeah, that, that's one of my goals, you know, and um, when Steve Farley was the senator for LD9, he had proposed reviewing those tax giveaways multiple times in the legislature, and uh, some of those bills actually passed one house or the other over the years that I, the four years that I've been there. So 
there are people on both sides of the aisle who know that what's happening is not sustainable and not fair. And I, I think that we definitely have to open up that tax code and review those tax giveaways. You know, most of the ones that were passed that are on the books now, they have no end date, they have no goals, right? So they'll just give money away forever. And uh, a lot of them, they're supposed to be reviewed, but then they're never reviewed. For example, back in December, I was on the uh, financial review committee for the, uh, for the, to review the tax giveaways. That was the first time in, I think, five years that that committee had met. You know, it's supposed to meet every year, just has a met, right? And so there is a mechanism to go in there and review those and get rid of the ones that are not working and, and eliminate them. The thing is that the, the legislature has not had broad support. We've had Republicans and Democrats voting yes for tax giveaways and Republicans and Democrats voting to repeal. So we need more people to want to repeal and to look at the fairness of these things. So I, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, like I said, I mean, I've seen these things pass one house or the other. Uh, Kansas did it. Kansas had a bipartisan effort a few years ago to eliminate the unsustainable tax breaks. And that's something that we have to do. That's where the money is. Thank you. Okay, we're going to try Tony again. Eric, you know, I work as a juvenile public defender, and Arizona is the last state in our country where personal possession of marijuana is still a felony. You know, ho hopefully legalization is going to pass, but for kids, it'll remain a felony. Hopefully here in Pima County, our new prosecutor will not be charging it, but, you know, it still leaves the rest of the states. So is there anything that can be done about that? Yeah, there was a lot of discussion on that uh, regarding uh, possession at 18 or possession at 21. And, you know, there's been a big push in the states to make tobacco possession 21, which I think is why the marijuana possession became 21 also. Uh, I am hoping that the, with the new prosecutor in Pima County that it won't be so ruthless against uh, possession. Um, if, if you have ideas on how to mitigate that, let me know, because I understand, I mean, the, the, the health concern, which I've heard from Dr. Freeze and others, is that um, your brain is still forming at, uh, under age 21 and that marijuana could hurt your brain development. Caffeine, tobacco, alcohol, those things all hurt your brain development under 21 too. Uh, and so... Um, it's a tough situation. I hear what you're saying. I don't want those kids to be charged with a felony. I don't want uh, mass incarceration from possession. I mean, that's something, that, again, that I campaigned on in 2015 is that, first of all, smart and safe. It's not a perfect initiative, but it will give us a lot of money to spend in the state of Arizona on good causes, and it will help this mass car incarceration issue with simple possession. Uh, we had an LD9 town hall last week in which we heard from uh, Marilyn Rodriguez, and she's the lobbyist who's promoting Smart and Safe. You know, it's horrendous. She said that most of the people are in, most of the adults are in jail for intent to sell, that they'll get you with dust in a baggie and a pipe, and they'll say, intent to sell. And, you know, it's really, it's draconian what we're doing. And um, I support ending mass incarceration, and I support legalization of marijuana as part of that. Part of that issue. All right. Thank you, Pam. All right. This is about uh, outlaw dirty money, and it's from Amy Graves. She says, uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Would you please share with us if you are willing to support a one-time exception to allow signatures collected for outlaw dirty money this past year to be allowed in 2022? Uh, yes, I am. And I, I think that I was really, I mean, I backed outlaw dirty money both times that it was trying to get on the ballot. And I really think that um, with a democratic legislature, you know, we should try to reinstate some of those um, campaign finance reform laws that were passed in the 90s. You know, we had more transparency in campaign finance, uh, but those, those laws that were passed when um, former Governor Jane Hull was the Speaker of the House after the ass scam bribery scandal, when so many people lost their jobs in the legislature and some got put into jail. We had reforms passed in the 90s and in the, I think it was 2013 or 2014, the Republicans in the middle of the night it dramatically increased the, the max donation in campaign finance. They got rid of some of the transparency. 
they made it easier to move money back and forth to different committees. And I think that we need to reinstate those laws. We need to repeal what the Republicans passed in, uh, in the teens. And <clears throat> I would put outlaw dirty money into law rather than going having the citizens fight over and over and over and over for transparency in campaign finance. The, the legislature should just pass it. We should know who's donating to these candidates. There was, a, there was a candidate in Maricopa County who had over $200,000 in dirty money uh, propping her up, and she didn't win. In the uh, Nancy Bartow-Heather Carter matchup uh, in the Senate, the race of the century, a million and a half dollars in that one race between two Republican women, you know, and so much dirty money was put up against them. I want to know. Who put up the you know three or four hundred thousand dollars against Heather Carter and the other groups who put up the three or four hundred thousand dollars against Nancy Barto? I mean, why is that amount of money being spent on a job that pays twenty four thousand dollars a year? We need campaign finance reform. We need transparency. I fully support outlaw dirty money. We need we need those laws. We would have a different government if we had clean elections, expanded. And we had we lessened the uh, the uh, role of money in politics across the country. Right on, Pamela. <clears throat> Got a follow up question about initiatives, especially now that the uh, state supreme court has allowed Invest in Ed to be on the ballot. And the, yes, I know. Excellent. <laughs> uh, question from Mary Ganapal. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do you think that the initiatives on the ballot will help bring out more independents and Democrats to vote in November? I'm hoping so. You know, so far, Invested Ed is on. Uh, from what I've heard, it looks like Smart and Safe is going to be on. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Second Chances, the, the, pri the prison reform, the sentencing reform, uh, got stopped by... Uh, people from Pima County, which is pretty disgusting. So I, I supported all four initiatives and I do hope that they will uh, help get out the vote. One other thing that died with the uh, COVID virus was that the Republicans, you know, they often try to put legislative ballot referrals on the ballot. And so they had several bad ones in the queue that didn't get passed. And for example, they had a, Speaker Bowers had his reefer madness uh, bill that he was trying to get as a ballot referral to confuse people about smart and safe. So that's not going to be on. So uh, right now, the two initiatives that look like they're getting on are two that actually came from the people, and there are no ballot referrals from the legislature to confuse people, I hope. Okay, we've got some interesting questions about public banking. So one of the things that, that never made TV in the Democratic Convention were the caucus sessions that I attended as a delegate. The platform calls for a um, national infrastructure bank that would uh, lend money at below market rates to counties and cities and states. It would be funded by investors buying treasury bonds, so it would not increase the debt, it would not increase taxes, and the money would all be used to build bridges and modern roads and rural broadband and schools and so forth. What do you think of that idea? And tell us about your plan for something similar in Arizona. Investors have been making money off of us for a long time, you know, and uh, I don't know uh, how much that will cost us to do something like that. I like the idea of a of a national infrastructure bank, but I don't know that I would have the money come from investors. You know, uh, the public banking model is to use a percentage of the of the public funds. You know, for example, right now we ha we essentially have investors funding infrastructure because we have Wall Street funding infrastructure, and with the Wall Street model, if you want to build a bridge or a highway, or for example, a train between Tucson and Phoenix, if you, if you uh, finance it through Wall Street, that doubles your cost. So if you have an infrastructure bank and it's financed by investors, I would still think the cost would be awfully high to the taxpayer. So with public banking, the taxpayers actually make money on their investment and they will keep building the general fund and the coffers rather than draining it. So. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the way he wants to, to finance that. All right. Quick question from Sandy Saltz, also about public banking. How is public banking different from the government picking and winning losers? And she asks, don't, uh, shouldn't businesses qualify to get their loans in the market? 
Well, they with public banking, they would have to qualify. The model is that uh, for the state bank is that you would use a percentage of the general fund. Like, for example, in um, New Hampshire, I think their slogan was 10% for us. So the idea was to take 10%, this is pre-COVID, right? pre-COVID numbers, take 10% of the general fund and use it for uh, low income, low interest loans, right, to small businesses. And the the loans would not be necessarily uh, given by the government, right? So this is like a, a public-private partnership, really, because you'd have the public funds uh, going through community banks. And so the public banking model actually helps community banking also because the, the theory is that the community banks know the businesses in their towns. They know who's trustworthy. Uh, they know the needs of the towns, for example. You know, in the state of North Dakota, the only state in the country that has a public bank, several years ago, they realized that they needed more daycare centers in rural North Dakota, right? So they put out an RFP saying, <clears throat> we'll give $250,000 low income, low, low cost loans or no interest loans to anybody who wants to set up a daycare center in rural North Dakota. We'll help you set it up. So they look at the needs of the people. They don't just dole out tax breaks, which is what uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority, uh, they are definitely picking winners and losers. And, and some of those investments have not worked out so well for communities like Arizona, like Tucson. You know, they have not met their uh, employment goals. Uh, Worldview, uh, Vector Launch, Caterpillar is the last I heard. None of them, they all got money from the Commerce Authority. None of them made their employment goals. And so this would be uh, much, people would have to qualify for it. it wouldn't just be doling out the funds. And we'd be looking at needs, right? Needs like reducing student debt. I mean, there's a lot that the Bank of North Dakota has done with offering low-cost student loans so the, the uh, students don't graduate with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt after they get out of college. And um, so anyway, I think it's a really good model. There's quite a bit of a, uh, information on our um, Arizona's for a New Economy on our Facebook page and on our website and also the Public Banking Institute because... Public banking is popping up all over the country as a solution to tax giveaways in a way that we could, you know, save the general fund and actually grow it and grow businesses at the same time. Great. We have a question from a well-known Democrat around town. Uh, that would be Jim Hanley. <laughs> he says, uh, can you tell us about your role in expanding dental care to rural Arizona? That's a good story. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so yeah, uh, a few years ago, I think it was the fall of 2017, there was a uh, what they call a interim uh, review, sunset review committee. It was like a whole day long review committee. And one of the items that was on the committee for that day was the expansion or creation of uh, what they call dental therapy. So this would be a different level of dentistry than was available in the state of Arizona. So we have we have dental health deserts statewide. Really, we even have dental health deserts where people need dental care and they can't afford it or there's no dentist in their area. And it's not just a rural issue. So I saw dental therapy as a way to expand access to care because it would help people with like lower level, uh, like teeth cleaning, checking their teeth. It could be used with telemedicine. Like for example, you could have a dental therapist up in, in Chin Lee could be, could be up there for the day doing uh, dental screenings like in an elementary school and, and take pictures of some little kid's mouth and send it to the dentist in Maricopa County saying, should this kid brush more or do, the, do they need an appointment? Do they need to come in? So it would help us you know, expand dental care and, and prevent serious tooth loss. And this was a big issue for the Native American tribes. It had been, they had been, tried to pass it several times in the state of Arizona, but it never got through. And so uh, this is a situation where I actually worked with Nancy Bartow on this because Nancy Bartow was promoting dental therapy as a way to save the state money. And I was promoting it as a way to expand dental health. And so hours of testimony, we got it through. I don't think it's been fully implemented, uh, but it is definitely a way to expand uh, dental health care through community health centers and through the tribes to rural Arizona. So I'm really, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of working with Nancy Bartow, who is somebody I don't necessarily agree with very often, you know, <laughs> but I, I follow one of the things that Steve Farley used to say all the time is that 
talk to them about what you agree on and don't bring up the stuff you don't agree on, you know, and that's how you get things done. So that's how I worked on the tax giveaways. That's how I worked on dental therapy. That's how I worked on community health workers. And, and, you know, that's how I work across the aisle. Very good. Uh, Susie Anderson, another one of our loyal members and board member, she wants to find out how many reasonable Republicans have you found with whom you can work? And how strong is the Republican Party in rural Arizona? You know, I don't know how strong they are in rural Arizona. Again, it's all about the money, right? Um, some of the more reasonable Republicans still vote with the extreme Republicans, unfortunately. That's what we saw in 2019 and 2020. Unfortunately, one of the most reasonable ones, which would have been Heather Carter, lost her re-election bid to Nancy Barto. It'll, it'll be interesting. I mean, like I said, I mean, but I mean, look at the tax giveaways, right? On the tax giveaways, I work with Vince Leach, right? And so... Again, somebody I don't necessarily agree on anything with, but he's the one who told me, well, with the G-plets, the schools are losing money because the the, gov the businesses don't pay their full share in property tax. I was like, really? I didn't know that until he told me. So I talk with everybody. I try to be nice to everybody. I ask questions. I meet with all the lobbyists. And so uh, I really try to be uh, open and communicative with everybody and not just one side or the other. All right. Pam, you've always been in favor of uh, fair tenant landlord laws. The moratorium uh, on evictions is going to expire just before election day, and evictions will probably start up. What would you do to combat all of these elections? It's just going to massively increase our homeless population. You know, when they were going to let people become evicted, you know, just a few weeks ago in, in July, I just, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it doesn't do us any good to throw these people out in the street and to separate these families because you evict a family, they get separated from their children, their children go into foster care. It's a ripple effect, right? Uh, I don't, I don't think that we should be doing this. I think that we should keep roofs over people's heads. Again, I, I think in the long term, the, the country might have to go to universal basic income with the loss of jobs and things like that. I mean, we, we, we have to open up the housing trust fund. There are ways to keep people in their houses that we have not used in the state of Arizona. For example, I didn't know this until 2019, I guess, that the housing trust fund had been, you know, funded $40 million a year, every year, no questions asked for decades. And it wasn't until the Wall Street crash that it got wiped out and, you know, just funded a tiny bit. And so there's a lot we could do with some of the laws we have on the books if we put money into them. Uh, and the housing trust fund is one of them. We could expand the um, vouchers for housing. Um, people are talking about rent strikes. Uh, People are talking about rent controls. You know, I, I'd like to learn more of what they want to do with those ideas. It doesn't do us any good to throw people out on the street. We have to solve that problem. You've always supported women's reproductive rights. How would you change the uh, state law in Arizona? What, what, what impediments are in place to, uh, uh, you know, basically women having legal control over their bodies? Yes. You know, there, the, you know, there are, I, I've told the Democrats many times, it's like, if we get control, we need to have a list of all the things we need to repeal, right? Because there's a lot of things to repeal in the area of women's health care. There's definitely laws that need to be repealed. Uh, I, I think that, you know, we, one of the things we saw in 2020 was the uh, Kathy Herod trying to um, pass the fake pregnancy clinics, right? We need to hold the line on misinformation, I think we should pass, you know, medically accurate sex education. I think we should make, uh, we should expand uh, access to cheap or free uh, contraception. There are a lot of unintended pregnancies, you know, in this state. And it stems from the idea that of not teaching sex education in, in school, not teaching respect to the boys and girls. And it also is access to care, access to those contraceptions and access to abortion. You know, women have to be able to choose when they want to have a baby. You know, one night slip up, you know, shouldn't put you and that child in poverty for the rest of your life. And so I think that there's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that can be repealed. I think that they, women should have, like I said, cheap or free access to contraception and the morning after pill. And they should have abortion on demand whenever they want it. 
they should be able to decide when they have a child. This is part of the structure of oppression against women is unintended pregnancy. Here, here. Question from Steve and Christina Early. Uh, this is back on uh, protections for tenants and eviction. They ask, why is money for Arizona, uh, apparently there's already a, a fund that's been established uh, to protect tenants and, and also to protect landlords. Why has this money not been used? One thing, so, I mean, I almost want not, don't even want to look at what Doug Ducey's doing, right? So before the legislature left, we appropriated $105 million for the COVID response, right? The Democrats had a plan on how that should be spent, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but the Republicans didn't want to have any plans. They just wanted to give them the money and he could spend it or not. So there's there's state money that he hasn't spent and there's federal money that he hasn't spent. And so as far as I'm concerned, except for making it look like he's, you know, fiscally conservative by saving money, there is no reason not to spend them funds to help the people. And so, yeah, ask Doug Doozy why he's not, you know, spending that money. Because a lot of it with the Trump administration money, it goes through the governor and it's his discretion. And as long as he doesn't have a special session, the re legislature has no control over it. He is, you know what, he is responsive to social media, though. It's kind of silly that that's the best case scenario for you reaching your governor. But if you do Twitter or Facebook or texting or phone calls or emails to that guy, you know, enough of us anyway, you know, you could sway him some. But we really have to push him to spend the money that he's got at hand to help the people. Absolutely. You know, LD9 has some really excellent programs on how to become familiar with Facebook, best, uh, how to become familiar with Twitter, basically how to use social media. And uh, once they give you the how-to, then they also tell you how to use it effectively. So, Pam, we've uh, exhausted our time slot. And, and I want to say thank you so much for your presentation. It was really powerful. Could you tell us how people can uh, support you and what you would like our, our pro Pam Powers Hanley audience to do for you? Like I said, my website is powersforthepeople.net. Uh, when I was in the legislature, uh, I did you know pretty much daily video updates uh, from my desk. All of those updates are on my website, Powers for the People, under the Update tab. I'm continuing to do updates. And so the best thing, one of the best things you can do is go to my blog at powersforthepeople.net, hit follow this blog, and then you will be sent uh, the videos and the updates. And since I'm a clean elections candidate, you're not going to be getting all these fundraising emails from me. But that will keep you apprised of the issues and what I'm doing and what I'm thinking. And then share them you know, send an email to your friends, tell them what's going on, share them on Facebook. Also, as I said earlier, we're going to be doing some educational phone calls now to uh, tell people who I am. Oops, my light just went out. <laughs> and then also we'd be doing um, phone calls as it gets closer to the event, to the November, as far as, you know, getting out the vote. Uh, we're going to have some postcards. We used to do postcard parties. Now we're going to be giving you postcards and stamps and telling you where to give them to people or where to mail them. So there's a lot of grassroots activity, uh, either by contacting me or by contacting AJ Flick, not AJ as in Allison Jones, our, you know, party chair, but AJ as in AJ Flick. But we're, we're going to be out there. We're going to be selling the progressive message. It's important to get out the progressive vote in, in 2020 because we need change in Phoenix and we need change in Washington. Pam, I want to thank you so much. For speaking to us today. You are completely inspirational, and I hope everybody on the Zoom meeting goes out, gets active in your campaign. And with that, I regret to close the meeting because I, I could have listened to you for another hour. But time's up, and I want to thank everybody, and particularly you, you Pam, for attending today's meeting of Democrats of Greater Tucson. So all the best to you, Pam. Thanks, Larry. See you guys right. later at lunch someday. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. It's, it's,